This is lecture 3D, and it'll be our first lecture on the topic of electrochemistry. Before we get into electrochemistry, we have some definitions we have to take care of concerning the properties of electricity. First, we have to define what charge is. Charge is abbreviated by the letter Q, and it's a property that matter possesses that causes it to experience something called the electromagnetic force. That's a force in physics that causes particles to either attract or repel each other, and things that possess charge that we may know of are things like electrons and protons. Now electrons, if we put them next to each other, repel each other. But if we put an electron and a proton next to each other, they attract. So if you possess the property of charge, there's actually two different types of charge, positive and negative, and like charges will repel, opposite charges will attract. In physics, we believe this occurs because things like electrons and protons can exchange photons between each other. If two electrons exchange photons between each other, they repel. If an electron and a photon, or rather an electron and a proton, exchange photons between each other, they attract. So if you're a particle and you're able to exchange photons with other particles, you possess charge. Now, how do we measure charge? We measure charge in the units of coulombs. Coulomb is abbreviated by capital C. And it's the quantity of charge equal to a whole bunch of electrons. It's the charge of 6.241 times 10 to the 18th electrons. Now, if electrons are moving in a wire, therefore charge is moving through a wire, then we can measure something called electric current or sometimes called amperage. This is telling how fast the charge is moving through a material. So it's the rate of flow of electric charge. It's actually called electric current. The reason it's sometimes called amperage is because the units for electric current is the ampere, abbreviated by capital A, and it's the flow rate of one coulomb of electron electric charge per second. So if let's say 6.241 times 10 to the 18th electrons are flowing through a wire each second, then that would be one ampere of electric current. Now, why do electrons flow from one spot to another? That's because two different, two different places or uh, spots will experience an electromotive force or a potential or a voltage between them. This is the potential difference between two different substances causing electrons to flow from one to the other. Electromotive force starts with an E. That's where the symbol for electromotive force comes from. It's a script E. It's sometimes just called electric potential or potential, or you've maybe heard it as voltage before. If you imagine a sodium atom and a fluorine atom, sodium has one valence electron, fluorine has seven, and fluorine being a very active nonmetal, has a strong tendency to attract electrons towards it. The sodium atom has a strong tendency to give up its electrons. So if you put a sodium atom and a fluorine atom next to each other, there's gonna be some potential attraction of the fluorine for that sodium's electron. So there will be an electromotive force between them or an electric potential between them or a voltage to just measuring how much more strongly the fluorine wants the electron than the sodium. That's what we mean by electromotive force or potential or voltage. And the way we measure the electromotive force is with a unit of volts. It's one joule of potential energy per coulomb of charge. So with those definitions intact now, let's start talking about uh, chemical reactions that involve the gaining and losing of electrons. Those are called oxidation reduction reactions. And let me give you an example of a spontaneous oxidation reduction reaction, one that occurs all by itself. If you take a chunk of iron metal and you place it into a solution of copper two ions, a spontaneous reaction will take place. The two valence electrons from the iron atom will be transferred over to the copper two ion that changes the iron atom into an iron positive two ion, and it changes the copper two ion into a copper atom. If you actually observe this change, this would be two little strips of, or two little uh, strands or wires of iron placed into a greenish solution that's made up of copper two ions. As the reaction occurs, the um, iron metal will start to turn into iron two ions, which means the metal will start to corrode away as the iron two ions float off into the solution. And the copper ions that are in the solution will gain the electrons and start turning the copper metal. And you're gonna actually see copper metal and it actually plates right on the two wires of iron. So iron is more reactive than copper. 
And we know that from its position on the periodic table, right? The most reactive metals on the periodic table are on the left. They get less active as you move to the right. So iron is to the left, copper is to the right, so iron must be more reactive. So therefore, the iron atoms will release their valence electrons and the less reactive element copper will have to gain those, turning into copper metal. And as this reaction occurs, you will start seeing the products of the chemical reaction in the test tube. This is the metallic copper that you see being produced right on the iron wires. And so this is an example of an oxidation reduction reaction that happens completely by itself, a spontaneous reaction. Now, every oxidation reduction reaction really has two components to it. It has the oxidation and it has the reduction. So we can actually break up the equation I have at the top of the slide into what are called two half reactions, an oxidation half reaction and a reduction half reaction. So redox reactions, which is the contraction for oxidation reduction, can be written as the sum of two half reactions. First, the oxidation. Oxidation is when a substance loses electrons. And in this reaction here, it's the iron atom turning into the iron positive two ion that's releasing electrons. So the oxidation half reaction is what's happening to the iron, not the copper. The iron is turning into positive two ions. Now all chemical equations need to have their charge balanced and this oxidation half reaction right now does not have a balanced charge. The atom on the left side has no charge and the iron ion on the right side has a positive two charge. So that means we have to include the electrons that are either being gained or lost into the equation to make sure that the charge of the reactant and product sides are the same. Oxidation is losing electrons. The electrons have to go on the right side then, showing they're being released. And because the iron ion is positive two, that means the iron atom must have released two electrons to form the iron positive two ion. You can now see the charges of the left and the right side of the yield sign both add up to zero. So this is a balanced oxidation half reaction now. The reduction is always the element who's gaining electrons. They call it reduction because its charge gets reduced. It's kind of weird. You're gaining something, but you're being reduced. Well, you're gaining negative electrons, so your charge goes down. And that's what's happening to the copper two ion because its charge is going down from positive two down to zero. So this would be the reduction half reaction. To balance this completely, we have to make sure the charge is equal on the left and the right side. And in this case, because the copper positive two ion is on the left side, giving the left side a positive two charge, and the copper atom on the right side has a charge of zero, I balance this by adding the electrons being gained or lost. It has to be gaining electrons here to make the charges add up to zero on both sides. So I have to be gaining two electrons. So the reaction we have at the top of the slide is actually the sum of these two half reactions. You can actually add these together and you can cancel out anything that's the same on the left and the right side. So if you actually add them together, you're going to wind up getting iron plus two electrons plus copper two yields iron two plus copper plus two electrons. And the two electrons on the left and the right sides cancel out. And now the reaction exactly equals the one we had at the very top. So oxidation reduction reactions consist of two half reactions that we're going to see quite a bit during this particular chapter. We're going to want to try to express them as their two half reactions. Now, here's where electrochemistry comes into play, because we've studied redox reactions. If I take the iron and the copper two ions, and I do not put them in the same beaker, then this reaction cannot happen. If I separate them, but somehow separate them in a way that allows electrons to transfer from the iron to the copper ion, but not directly on the surface, I can actually get electricity to be produced from a redox reaction. So if the solid iron and the copper two ions are separated, but we somehow connect them with a wire, we can make the electron transfer go through a wire, and electrons moving through a wire has a name. It's called electricity. Let's see how you can do that. Take a look at this setup. The two reactants that we're gonna be dealing with are the iron, elemental iron. So I've got a big stick of elemental iron over there in that left beaker. And what do we want the iron to react with? We want it to react with copper two ions. So notice I don't have any copper two ions in that beaker. Where are the copper two ions? They're in the other beaker. And so if the iron and the copper two ions are separated from each other, they can't directly react because the iron can't bump into the copper two ion and transfer its electrons. 
So what somebody has engineered is a way to connect the iron metal via a wire over to a piece of copper metal in the right beaker. And so the electrons can actually travel from the iron through the wire and make their way over to the piece of copper metal on the right side. Now, as that happens, if an iron atom loses a pair of electrons, it turns into an iron ion. So it's no longer a piece of elemental iron metal, so it actually dissolves into the solution. So as this process were to occur, you would start seeing iron two ions being created in the solution, and your big stick of iron metal would actually start to uh, decompose away as it turns into the ions. So as the electrons move through the wire over to the right side, the electrons go down onto the piece of copper. And then if a copper two ion bumps into that piece of copper metal, the electrons can jump from the copper metal onto the copper two ion, and it'll cause a piece of a, an atom of copper to be formed. So the copper two ions will form copper atoms. So this reaction causes the iron to turn into iron two ions and the copper two ions to turn to copper. <clears throat> but as soon as two electrons travel over to the right beaker and a copper ion turns into a copper atom, the right beaker now has two extra negative charges in it. And the left beaker therefore would have two extra positive charges. And as soon as the left beaker has built up any negative charge at all, that will repel further electrons from being transferred. So no other reaction will occur, it stops. So one other component is needed to create electricity and that is something called a salt bridge. And a salt bridge is either a chunk of salt that's molded into a U-type shape, or it can be a glass tube, which I have in this picture, that's either filled with salt or filled with a gelatinous material that allows ions to pass through it. So as the two electrons travel from the left to the right, and they turn the copper ion into the copper atom, in order to maintain electrical neutrality, what has to happen is, the counter ions in the right solution, in this case the nitrate ions, have to go into the salt bridge or into the gelatinous material and migrate their way from the right to the left and wind up popping out into the beaker on the left side. So what's happening here is the electrons move through the wire in the top and as two electrons move from the left to the right, at that same time two negative nitrate anions move through the salt bridge from the right beaker to the left beaker and now both beakers remain neutral and therefore electrons can continue to flow. You'll find you're only going to ever get electricity if you can make charged particles move in a complete uninterrupted circuit. If you pulled that salt um, bridge out, no electrons would flow, there'd be no electricity. Now, in a setup like this where we've separated what's being oxidized from what's being reduced, the piece of metal that uh, exists where the uh, substance is being oxidized is called the anode. So the electrode is a piece of metal that's submerged into a solution, and it's the piece of metal where oxidation occurs. So the reaction that was occurring over here in the left beaker was solid iron turning into iron two ions plus two electrons. That's the oxidation, so the piece of metal in this beaker is called the anode. The piece of metal in the other beaker, which is the piece of copper we have, is the piece of metal that's submerged into a solution that's undergoing reduction. And so that piece of metal, even though it's not what's reacting, right, the iron's reacting with copper ions, but the piece of metal in that right beaker is called the cathode because that's the electrode where reduction occurs. The reaction that's occurring over here is the electrons come down onto the piece of copper metal and then jump onto the copper two ion. So it's the copper two ion gaining two electrons that's being reduced into copper metal. And because that's a reduction, we would say that the a piece of copper is your cathode. Now, as the electrons flow, if you attach something to the wire called a voltmeter, it's going to show a number measured in volts of 0.78. That's telling the potential difference or the attraction of the copper two ions for the electrons from the iron. And so 0.78 volts is called the cell potential or the cell voltage or the cell EMF, which stands for electromotive force. And it's just the potential difference. It's the attraction of the chemical in the beaker on the right to the electrons from the chemical in the beaker on the left. Now, when you break up 
an oxidation reduction reaction. So the two reactants are separated from each other. And the only way the reaction can occur is if electrons travel through a wire, you have created what chemical engineers call a galvanic cell. It's called an electrochemical cell because it produces electricity or electric current from a chemical reaction. That's what a galvanic cell is. Electrochemical cell can either produce electricity from a chemical reaction or produce a chemical reaction from electricity. We'll see that other type a little bit later. But this is an electrochemical cell that produces an electric current from a spontaneous chemical reaction. It's just we separate the two reactants from each other so the electrons cannot transfer on their surfaces. The electrons have to transfer through a wire. So it's an electrochemical cell that produces an electric current from a chemical reaction and more specifically, a spontaneous oxidation reduction reaction. Now, if you set up a galvanic cell, there's a shorthand way to represent how the, it has been constructed. What they usually do is they name what the anode is, then they put a single uh, vertical line, and then they tell what the anode is in contact with, which will be the anode solution. Then the anode solution is actually not in contact with the cathode solution. They're separated by a salt bridge. So they put two vertical lines showing there's no direct contact between them. The cathode solution comes next, and then a single vertical line showing that the cathode solution is in contact with a piece of metal called the cathode. So for the cell that we just drew, what we have is our anode, a piece of iron metal. The anode solution was a solution of iron two ions. The cathode solution was a solution of copper two ions, and the cathode was a piece of copper metal. So the shorthand notation for our cell would be Fe, single line, Fe2+, plus, and then whatever its molarity was, I'll just pick one molar. Double line showing we're now separating one beaker from another, but they're actually connected only with a salt bridge. Then we have a solution of copper two ions with its molarity, and then it's in contact with one line, uh, a cathode made up of elemental copper. So this is a galvanic cell. This is how we represent it. It's just a spontaneous chemical reaction, but it allows electrons to transfer through a wire, and that's how we can get electricity out of a chemical reaction. Now, we've just finished a unit on thermodynamics, and we were talking about the thermodynamic property free energy, and we know the free energy change of a chemical reaction tells us whether it's spontaneous or not. Well, it turns out that the free energy change of a reaction that occurs in a galvanic cell is related to the cell's potential, the electromotive force or its voltage. And that relationship is this. And so you'll need to know this, the free energy change of a galvanic cell, which means the chemical reaction in a galvanic cell, is gonna equal negative NFE, and let's define each of these terms. N is the number of moles of electrons that are transferred during the redox reaction. F is a constant, we call it the Faraday constant, and it's actually the charge of one mole of electrons. And I'll give you that number. You won't need to memorize that. That would be given on the test. But the charge of one mole of electrons equals 96,485 coulombs. The script E is our electromotive force, our voltage, which is the potential difference between the chemical on the left and the chemical on the right and the two different beakers that causes the electrons to flow through the wire. So it's the potential difference causing electrons to flow. And if you have a galvanic cell where all the concentrations are one molar, then that's a standard state cell. So I could say delta G naught would equal negative NF and then our voltage to indicate it's based upon a standard cell with one molar concentrations. I would put a little naught up there. I would say E naught for that. In terms of how you're going to get the units for your answer, we know that delta G naught is measured in joules or delta G is measured in joules and the quantity of matter is measured in moles. The Faraday constant is how many coulombs uh, a mole of electrons have. So it's the units are coulombs per mole of electrons. And the electromotive force is measured in volts. And so somehow this doesn't look like it's gonna work out. And that's because we'll have to substitute out what a volt actually is. And from at the beginning of the lecture, we talked about a volt is the amount of charge. Uh, it's the actually the, the potential energy difference, so joules per charge, and so it's joules per coulomb. So if you remember a volt is joules per coulomb, then the moles cancel out, the coulombs cancel out, and the units will work out. 
So I'll try to sometimes replace voltage with joules per coulomb so we can actually see that happen. So let's see if we can calculate the standard free energy change for the reaction that we've just talked about, iron reacting with copper two ions. And we know that the standard electromotive force or the standard voltage for this galvanic cell is 0.78 volts, okay? Now, one thing about electromotive forces that you'll need to know is that the electromotive force, whether it's standard or non-standard, doesn't matter, is always given as the potential for the change of one mole of electrons. So therefore, it's what we call an intensive property. Doesn't depend upon the amount of chemical change. If you look at my balanced equation, I have coefficients of one, 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 one. If I switch the coefficients to two, 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 I'd actually be changing double the number of moles of electrons. But what voltage would I say? I would say 0.78, because that voltage is always the potential difference if you change one mole of electrons. So that's called an intensive property. If we look at our relationship between delta G naught and then the E naught value, which is delta G naught equals negative N F E naught, this E naught here is an intensive property. It does not depend upon the amount of chemical change, but delta G naught does. Same thing for the other thermodynamic properties we talked about last unit. Entropy, enthalpy, and free energy are extensive properties. They depend upon how much chemical change occurs. Right, if you think about enthalpy changes, if you burn one log in a fireplace, it'll give off a certain amount of heat. But if you burn two logs in a fireplace, it gives off twice the amount of heat, right? These are extensive properties. The same thing for free energy. So if our voltage is an intensive property, in order to make it an ex extensive property, delta G, we have to multiply by the number of moles that are in the reaction. That's why the N appears on the right side of the equation. So if we multiply by the number of moles of electrons that were transferred on a reaction, two moles, multiply by the Faraday constant, and multiply by the voltage, we will now get the delta G naught for this particular reaction. And if I uh, rewrite my voltage as joules per coulomb, we'll be able to see the moles cancel out, the coulombs cancel out, we'll get our answer in joules, and that comes out negative 150,000 joules as my uh, delta G naught for this reaction. Now, because delta G naught came out a negative number, what does that tell us? That means the reaction is spontaneous. What was the uh, voltage of this uh, reaction? It was positive 0.78. Delta G naught and the voltage are essentially related to each other through a negative sign in the equation. So that means that if we have a spontaneous reaction, delta G naught will have to be negative, and therefore the voltage will have to be positive. So we can actually use voltages to predict spontaneity. If you have a positive voltage, that means a reaction is spontaneous, just like we had learned last unit that if a free energy change is negative, that means the reaction's uh, spontaneous as well. Now, the more negative a delta G is for a particular reaction, the more spontaneous that process is. And so similarly, the greater the voltage of a galvanic cell, the more spontaneous that particular reaction or that particular uh, process is. Now, when dealing with galvanic cells, we like to define the potential for both oc the oxidation half reaction and the reduction half reaction. And so these are called oxidation and reduction potentials. A reduction potential is the electric potential for a reduction half reaction. And to indicate that it's not the voltage for a complete chemical reaction, it's only the voltage for a reduction, they write it uh, script E sub RED. So that says reduction potential as opposed to just the potential for a balanced chemical equation. An oxidation potential, which would be written script E sub OX, is the electric potential for an oxidation half reaction. And <clears throat> if you have a standard uh, reaction, a standard state cell, so copper ions are one molar, iron ions are one molar, then we would represent their uh, reduction in oxidation potentials as E naught sub RED and E naught sub OX. These are the symbols for standard state half reactions. And as we talked about uh, just a couple of moments ago, the more positive a value is for the voltage, the more spontaneous a reaction is. Well, the same thing for reduction potentials and oxidation potentials. The more positive the reduction or the oxidation potential, the more spontaneous the half reaction is going to be. Let me give you an example of that. 
Here's a couple of reduction reactions, right? They're gaining electrons. So if you gain electrons, that's reduction. I have fluorine gaining electrons to become fluoride ions, iodine gaining electrons to become iodide ions. Which reaction do you think is more spontaneous? Well, that would be the one in which the non-metal is more reactive, right? What do reactive non-metals do? They gain electrons more easily. So which non-metal element is more reactive? And that would be the one closer to the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table. That would be fluorine. So if fluorine's more reactive, that means it more strongly gains electrons. So its reduction potential had better have a higher value than iodine's. And if you look them up, the reduction potential for fluorine is 2.87. Iodine's is only 0.54. That just tells you that fluorine has a stronger attraction for electrons than iodine does. Let's look at some oxidation reactions. Here's three different metals. Metals tend to get oxidized. They readily lose electrons. Potassium, calcium, and copper. If you want to predict which one of these has the most positive oxidation potential, it's going to have to be the one from the most reactive metal. And metals are most reactive on the left side of the periodic table. And as you move to the right, they become less reactive. So potassium being furthest to the left should be the most reactive metal. That's the one that's going to release electrons more easily. So it's going to have the most positive oxidation potential. Oxidation potential for potassium, 2.92. Calcium is a little bit less reactive, 2.76. Copper, wow, it's one of the really unreactive metals. It should have a really low oxidation potential. In fact, it even dips over into the negative, but definitely lower than the other two. So these potentials will give you indications to how spontaneous given reactions are. And the potential of an overall redox reaction in a galvanic cell is measured with a voltmeter. So we can measure the voltage of a complete chemical reaction. If we have, let's say, two half reactions occurring in a galvanic cell, like the one we started the lecture with, iron turning into iron two ions and copper two ions turning into copper, if I add these together, I'm going to get the overall redox reaction in this galvanic cell. Electrons cancel out. The overall reaction is iron plus copper two ions yields iron two ions plus copper. If you stick a voltmeter on that wire, you're going to get the voltage of the cell. And if it's standard state conditions, it's going to be 0.78. So what has to happen is uh, to get that 0.78, you would have to add the oxidation potential for the iron and the reduction potential for the copper as well. So the sum of the reduction potential and an oxidation potential must equal the potential for the overall redox reaction. The unfortunate thing is we can't measure the potential for an individual reduction or of an individual oxidation. So I don't know what these two numbers are. They could be 0 0.30 and 0 0.48. Does that make sense? That would add up to 0.78. But they might be 0 0.20 and 0.58. The reason I don't know what they are is that I cannot measure them. You can only measure the voltage of a complete chemical reaction. So unfortunately, we don't know what they are. The potentials of a half reaction cannot be measured, so what we do is we make one up. Seems kind of strange, but it's actually not a bad idea. <clears throat> Let me show you something else to not a bad idea either. You see this map of the world? See that line over there on the very right side? Do you know what that is? What's that line? It goes around Russia and goes around New Zealand. That's called the International Date Line. What's the significance of the international date line? Do you know what that is? <clears throat> Back in the 1980s, there was this group called X, and they sang this song called Los Angeles. And in it, they had a really good little stanza that really talked about this. They, X scene, the singer there, sang, she gets confused flying over the date line. Her hands turn red because the days change tonight, change in an instant. You think about that. That may be what a elementary school person might think about if they first learned about the international date line. It's when you change days. So if you go over that line, the day changes. And so, guy, what happens if you're in a plane, you fly over that line, well, all of a sudden day become night or night become day. I always, I always love that line, but that doesn't happen. You fly over that line, all of a sudden it doesn't become dark or become light. Here's how it works, okay? Let's say we're in Los Angeles and it's nine o'clock in the morning right now, okay? What time is it if you move east to, let's say, New York? At New York, they're in three time zones past us. So it's 12 o'clock in New York. So today, if it's Monday, it's 9 o'clock here in Los Angeles or in Orange County. 
in New York, it's 12 o'clock on Monday. If you go across the ocean over to London, it's five time zones later. It's actually 5 p.m. The day is almost over in London. And if you keep traveling east and you go to Dubai, it's 10 o'clock at night. So people are starting to go to sleep in Dubai on Monday. Now watch this. What if you go to Beijing? It's past midnight. So in Beijing, right now, if it's nine o'clock here on Monday morning in Los Angeles, it's Tuesday night at 1 a.m. in Beijing. And if you then move to Auckland, New Zealand, it's five time zones later, it's actually six in the morning on Tuesday in Auckland. So what if you continue going to the right and you get back to Los Angeles, which is three time zones over from Auckland, it would now be 9 a.m. on Tuesday. Wait a second, it's nine o'clock on Monday. How can this be? So to make things work, people decided we've got to pick a line somewhere on the earth that if you cross that line, you go back a day. And that's the international date line. So if you're in Auckland and it's 6 a.m. and you travel east, as soon as you cross that international date line, instead of being Tuesday at 6 a.m., it becomes Monday at 6 a.m. And so now when you get to Los Angeles, it's going to be 9 a.m. on Monday, not 9 a.m. on Tuesday. So sometimes we make random assumptions, and that's what we do here when we deal with uh, electromotive forces for oxidation and reduction half reactions. We take this half reaction, this one's actually written as an oxidation, hydrogen gas producing two hydrogen ions and uh, releasing two electrons. We can't measure the oxidation potential for this reaction, but we can assign it a number. We're going to assign it a value of zero. So this standard hydrogen half reaction is assigned a potential of zero. And then every other standard reduction potential on our chart of reduction potentials are going to be measured relative to this one. Here's how it works. Let's make a galvanic cell. But on the left side, instead of putting iron with iron two ions, let's put a tube of hydrogen gas being bubbled down into a solution of one molar hydrogen ions. That's going to be the uh, anode, there'll be a piece of inert metal like platinum where the hydrogen is being bubbled off of. So that's going to be the anode submerged into a solution of hydrogen ions. It's going to be connected to a wire and that wire is going to hook over to the right side to a piece of copper metal, which will be submerged into a solution of copper two ions. And then that's where re reduction is going to occur. So this is going to be the cathode where the copper ions will gain electrons to form copper. If you add these two half together, the electrons cancel out. And so the overall reaction in this galvanic cell would be hydrogen gas reacting with copper two ions by transferring the electrons through the wire because they're not in contact with each other to produce two hydrogen ions plus copper metal. We can measure the voltage of this overall reaction by just sticking a voltmeter on the wire and it comes out to be 0.34 volts. That's the only thing we can measure. So if we have assumed that the hydrogen oxidation reduction or hydrogen oxidation reaction has an oxidation potential of zero, then you can now figure out what the copper half reactions reduction potential has to be because zero plus X has to add to be 0.34. So that means the reduction potential for copper is 0.34. And this is how every single reduction or oxidation potential are determined. They all are assumed to be, uh, you assume hydrogen has an oxidation potential of zero. And so anything that couples with that, you can then figure out what its reduction potential would have to be. So we have on handout six on our class website, a list of standard reduction potentials. And so these are all written as reductions and they all have the reduction potentials there. And every single one was calculated, coupling it with a hydrogen, hydrogen ion reaction that's treated as the oxidation, and then you can figure out what the reduction potential for each of these have to be. Here's the key one right here. The hydrogen ions plus two electrons goes to hydrogen written as a reduction. It's got a value of 0.00. .00. I wrote the reaction the other way around. See at the top right on the slide, it says the hydrogen goes to hydrogen ions plus two electrons. If that's an oxidation and its voltage is zero, if I reverse the reaction, I would just change the sign and zero doesn't have a change of sign. So whether it's an oxidation or reduction, its potential is gonna wind up being zero. All the other ones are met relative to that. Now, 
what are going to be the uses for these standard reduction potentials that are listed on handout six of the class website? Three uses for those today. First, predicting the spontaneity of a reaction. We've already learned to determine spontaneity by calculating thermodynamically the free energy change of a reaction but you can actually calculate the spontaneity by just using reduction potentials handout six. So let's determine if the following standard reaction is spontaneous or not. Three Fe solid plus two Cr3 positive aqueous yields three Fe2 plus aqueous plus two Cr solid. If you want to do this with thermodynamics, you would go to handout five and you would look up the standard free energy of formations of the reactants and products, and you would just go products minus reactants, and if you got a delta G naught value that was negative, that would be spontaneous. An alternate way to do that would be to use handout six and look up the reduction potentials, and you need to find two reduction potentials that can be used to make this reaction. So that means you need to find a reduction potential that has iron with iron two in it, and another one that has chromium three with chromium in it. So looking at handout six, you're going to have to scan that for iron and for chromium. And on this chart right here is the one that says iron 2 plus 2 electrons goes to iron. It's important you look carefully because there's also one on here that says iron 3 plus 3 electrons goes to iron. You wouldn't use that in this case because there's no iron 3 ions in there. So just be discriminating when you use handout 6 and make sure you see the charges correctly. So I'm going to write that down. It said iron 2 plus 2 electrons yields iron and the reduction potential in the chart is negative 0.44 volts. Now I've got to find my reaction that contains chromium and chromium-3 ions, and that's located right here. And if I write that down, three electrons plus chromium-3 yields chromium, that reduction potential is negative 0.73. Okay, so what do we do with these? The reaction at the top, the orange one, we're trying to determine if it's spontaneous or not, is a redox reaction. It contains an oxidation and a reduction. When you look up things on handout six, they're all going to be reductions. So one of these has to be reversed to be an oxidation. So we have to add a reduction and an oxidation half reaction in order to make the desired reaction at the top. So you've got to reverse one of those. And the way we do that is you reverse the one that's necessary so that they can add together to make the reaction that's given at the top. So I'm going to reverse the iron half reaction because in the top reaction, iron was supposed to turn into iron too. So I've got to reverse that iron reduction to make an oxidation. So now it says iron goes to iron two plus two electrons. That's now become an oxidation. And the way the oxidation potential is related to the reduction potential because we've just reversed the reaction is you just change the sign. So the oxidation potential now becomes positive 0.44 volts. Now, voltages uh, do not depend upon the amount of chemical change. So I don't have to worry about multiplying the top reaction by three and then maybe multiplying the oxidation potential by three. I don't worry about multiplying the bottom reaction by two and then having to multiply the reduction potential by two. All I have to do is add these together. And if it comes out at a positive or negative number, that's what tells you if the reaction is spontaneous or not. If the voltage comes out to be a negative number, that means the reaction is not spontaneous. Positive voltage is spontaneous, negative or not. So this means the reaction is non spontaneous in the forward direction, or you could say it's the reverse reaction that's spontaneous. So in order to predict spontaneity, you look up two reduction reactions from handout six that can be used to add up to make a given reaction. You reverse the appropriate one so that when you add them together, they actually put the correct reactants and correct products in their proper places. And then you just add the two potentials. If it's positive, it's spontaneous. If it's negative, it's non spontaneous. The second thing you can do is you can use these potentials to predict strong oxidizing and reducing agents. Conceptually, this is the most challenging thing in this entire chapter, so don't fall asleep now, okay? If we take a particular reduction potential, and I can take any one, but I'm going to take the iron 2 uh, reduction reaction, the two electrons being added to the iron 2 ions are forming elemental iron. So what's being reduced in this reaction? Reduction is gaining electrons. Who's gaining the electrons? It's the iron two ions. They're being reduced. Anything that is reduced is causing something else to be oxidized, so therefore this is an oxidizing agent. So the substance in a chemical reaction that's being reduced is called an oxidizing agent. What's being oxidized here? 
you'd have to see the reaction going in the reverse direction. If you go in the reverse direction, the iron turns into iron two ions and releases a pair of electrons. So the iron is what's being oxidized, but only if the reaction goes in the reverse direction. And if the iron is being oxidized, it causes something else to be reduced, so therefore it is a reducing agent. So it's kind of opposite how these terms are related to each other, but you just have to be able to deal with that. Now, <clears throat> if you have a large positive reduction potential, that means the forward reaction is spontaneous. In fact, it's very spontaneous. Look at the chart. Look at the very top of the chart there. You've got fluorine and a silver ion. Their potentials are 2.87, 1.99. Those are the largest positive reduction potentials on this chart. If they have really high positive reduction potentials, that means the reactants there have a strong tendency to be reduced. And if they have a strong tendency to be reduced, guess what they are? They are strong oxidizing agents. So what's the best oxidizing agent on this list? It's the substance that wants to be reduced the most. So that has to be the most positive reduction potential. You go to the very top of the chart there. And what's the substance that's being reduced here? This is where you want to make sure you don't get it wrong. It's not the fluoride ion. It's the fluorine. That's what's gaining the electron. So whatever gets, gains the electrons most readily, that's the one that is reduced the most easily. That's the best oxidizing agent. So fluorine, elemental fluorine F2, would be the best oxidizing agent from this list. Now, if you have a large negative reduction potential, that actually means the reverse reaction is spontaneous. So if you go to the very bottom of the chart where the reduction potentials are really negative, those reactions don't happen in the forward direction easily. They happen in the reverse direction easily. The, these bottom reactions so that tend to turn back reactant. So the product has a strong tendency to be oxidized, to lose its electrons. And if it has a strong tendency to be oxidized, it is a strong reducing agent. So what's the best reducing agent from this list? Well, reducing agents are things that get oxidized. And because these are reduction potentials, you have to go to the worst one. And that would be the one at the bottom, negative, negative 3.05, which is the lithium. So this is the reaction that wants to undergo oxidation the most. And what is it that's being oxidized? It's going to be the product. So that product lithium is the substance that's going to be the best reducing agent because it has the greatest tendency to be oxidized. So from this list, you can determine strong oxidizing agents that are the reactants for the reduction potentials that are the most positive and the best reducing agents, they're the products in the reduction reaction uh, that, that are most negative. Third thing we can do with the standard reduction potentials, and now we can finally relate this to the galvanic cells we've talked about, is we can actually predict the potential and the spontaneous reaction in a galvanic cell, and we'll see if we can do an example and show you how this works. So let's say we construct a galvanic cell with silver and nickel electrodes, and they're submerged in one molar solutions of silver ion and nickel two ions respectively. So maybe you can picture this. You had a beaker on the left that has a silver ion solution with a piece of silver in it. On the right, you have a beaker with a bunch of nickel two ions dissolved in the water and then a piece of nickel in it. They're connected by a wire and there's a salt bridge connecting the two beakers. We're gonna see if we can determine A, the standard cell potential, B, the spontaneous reaction, and C, what the anode and cathode are. So for A, if you wanna calculate what the standard cell potential is, you have to find the two reduction potentials from handout six to produce this galvanic cell. And on our handout six, we need to find something that has silver with silver ions and then nickel with nickel two ions. So here's the reaction with a silver ion and a silver atom. Let me write that down. That reduction reaction is an electron plus silver ion yields silver and the reduction potential is 0 0.80 volts. Then we've got to find the one with nickel and nickel two ions and that's located here. So let's write that down. Two electrons plus nickel two ion yields nickel the reduction potential is negative 0.23 volts, okay? Now, the spontaneous reaction is, well, wait a second, we don't know. That's what we're trying to figure out. So how do I know which one I'm gonna switch? Well, here's the key. If it's a galvanic cell, galvanic cells produce electricity from spontaneous reactions. The reaction has to be spontaneous, which means the overall voltage has to be positive. So that means that when I reverse one of these reactions to make it an oxidation, because I need to have one of each, 
my total voltage better come out to be positive. So if you're going to do that, the largest positive potential has to be the one you keep. So of the two reduction potentials we've just written down for silver and for nickel, the largest positive potential is going to be the more spontaneous process. It will get to stay a reduction. So because silver ions with an electron turning to silver has a potential of 0 0.80, which is higher than negative 0.23, that means the silver reaction will be the spontaneous reduction, and therefore nickel will not be a reduction. Nickel is going to be the oxidation. We're going to have to reverse the nickel reaction. So the one that's the lower value for the reduction potential must be reversed. We'll change to an oxidation, and now when we write its oxidation potential, it's going to have the same number, but it's going to have an opposite sign. So reversing that nickel reaction to make it an oxidation, and now it's going to have a potential that's called an oxidation potential. I just changed the sign. Its oxidation potential is now 0.23. And all you have to do is add the reduction and oxidation potentials together to get the cell potential. And so if you add these together, that means that if you stuck a voltmeter on this galvanic cell, it should register, register 1.03 volts. That's how you get a voltage. B, let's see if we can determine the spontaneous reaction. In order to do this, we have our two half reactions already written. We have the silver ion being reduced to silver atoms and the nickel atoms being oxidized to nickel two ions. So if you want to add an oxidation reduction reaction together, what has to happen is you have to make sure the number of electrons gained in the first reaction is exactly equal to the number of electrons lost in the second. And right now the electrons are not equal. The silver ion is only gaining one electron, but the nickels are losing two. So what you do is you multiply the entire silver half reaction by two, and we just change it to two electrons plus two silver ions yields two silver atoms. And now the electrons gained and lost are exactly equal. Remember, it does not change the potentials because the potentials are always on a per one mole of electron basis. So they don't care how you write the reaction on the left. In fact, if you double the silver reaction like we have here, really the potential for that has doubled to 1.60. But how do you write down a reduction potential? You'd say 1.60 divided by two electrons and it goes back to 0 0.80 volts per one electron. So now that we have our two half reactions written, you can cancel out the electrons on the two sides, and we now get the reaction that's spontaneously occurring in this galvanic cell. The silver ions are reacting with nickel atoms, although they're not in contact with each other. It only happens because electrons travel through a wire to produce two silver atoms plus nickel two ions. Okay. So once again, the voltage that's given in the problem here that we calculated is always the change for one mole of electrons. So it didn't matter that I multiplied the silver half reaction by two. It doesn't matter if the nickel reaction has two moles of electrons in it. Whatever the voltage would be, if you change two or three or four electrons, you would actually then divide it by the two or three or four, and you'd get it back onto a per mole basis. Now, part C says, what's the anode and the cathode? Now you just have to recognize what metal is involved in the oxidation and what metal is involved in the reduction because that'll determine the anode and the cathode. So the nickel half reaction is the one that's been switched to become oxidation. So because that's where the oxidation is occurring, the piece of nickel in that particular beaker is going to wind up being the anode. So the nickel half reaction is the oxidation, therefore nickel is the anode. Here's a really easy way to get this correct. Oxidation and anode both start with vowels, so whatever is the oxidation, that has to be the anode. The silver reaction is the reduction reaction, and because uh, the silver metal is in that container, that silver is going to be the cathode. So the silver half reaction is the reduction, therefore the silver metal is the cathode, and here these are both consonants, right? R and C are consonants, and so they wind up going together. That's how you identify your uh, anode and cathode. 